I always wanted to do that. So, welcome. I am now the documentarian presently known as Zan True Luck. The reason you all are used to coming to see me are for a couple of reasons. One, you're seeing me tonight because I've gained some type of notoriety and now you're like, who is this guy? I want to go figure out more about him. You're in the exact place you're supposed to be in. This is the video that you need to be watching. For anybody who's been following for a long time, you get a treat because you haven't seen me unveil my painting Wade in the Water yet. And now I finally want to give you that. I wanted to make this a really intimate journey with me as an artist to allow people to really see every step of the way. So I've been giving it to you in pieces via my Instagram, and hopefully you've been following from the beginning, but I'm gonna bring you along that journey of my thoughts so that you feel like you were really with me every single footstep. This is that footprints in the sand moment. You were not Jesus, but you have kind of been a ghost standing by seeing me on these little bits and pieces, but now I'm gonna make this picture holistic for you. So I'm gonna approach this differently than I've done any other Masterpiece Studio video. I guess this is the Masterpiece sitting room tonight. We're even in a special location, shot on location for this reason of bringing you something different. This is a special experience. I want you to honor how sacred all of this has been for me, but especially this moment. I've not let any, I think maybe five sets of human eyes have laid eyes on this painting. To be quite honest, the painting is behind the camera right now. I'm so proud of my work that I've been sitting marveling at it the entire time. And that means more to me than anything because usually I'm coming here and I'm seeking validation. I'm, I'm looking in maybe not just the studio chats, but in anything, when I'm putting out my work, I'm putting it out for you all. I'm putting it out for public consumption. I'm putting it out for people to engage in conversation. I'm putting it out to make an impact, whether that's emotionally, whether that's social change, whatever that is, I'm hoping that you take these pieces of me and they become pieces of you. With this, when I completed it, I was comfortable with this just being a piece of me. I honestly never needed another set of eyes to lay eyes on it. I was so happy with everything I've done up until this point and my ability to put all of those things in this painting. I just felt like it was my masterpiece work. So when I've been calling this masterpiece studio, I truly haven't felt like I had a masterpiece yet until I finished this in September. So when we talk about that timeline, I started this journey in May and I'm gonna watch a video clip of or a mashup of all these individual clips while we're talking through this. This is my Michael Jordan, The Last Dance moment. ESPN, don't sue me for mentioning that. And Chris Waterloo, I'll cover up your logo if you try to sue me as well. I actually didn't even plan to do that like that, but that worked out well. So as I was saying, I started the journey in May and I had this video mashup of all of the different compilations from my Instagram, whether that's videos I posted in my story, post on my actual timeline, and I'm going to bring you through this timeline with me in a non, this is just me scrolling digitally for, through all these posts type of format. I'm really, again, bringing you along a journey and an experience in a unique and refreshing way, I hope. So I'll start by reading the first time I introduced you all to Wade in the Water. So I completed, Wade, I completed the burning bush right before Wade in the Water, and we'll get to that whole segment in a little bit. But this is the first time you saw me come out with art again in a long time, and you didn't know what I was coming with. So I was exploring a series called Women Are Elemental, which I'm still exploring today. And when I posted this, I say Wade in the Water before I go back to large pieces. So this is the second in a series of very small pieces, small in my mind, anything under two by three feet is small to me. So on the post, I say, John 5, 4 speaks about the pool at Bethesda where Jesus told the man to take up his bed and walk. Some accounts say this was the biblical basis for the slave singing, wade in the water. God's gonna trouble the water. The man at Bethesda was laying by the water because the town knew from time to time an angel from God would touch the water, purify it. And those who entered after the water had been troubled by the angel of the Lord would be made whole. Black women are truly from God of God and the embodiment of God. When black women trouble the water, anyone who enters thereafter could be cleaned. I won't give away all the detail of this piece just yet, but there are some really important tie-ins coming. So this is May 9th. This is following my completion of Burning Bush, which at that time I felt like was my best piece to date. I just didn't know how I could push further, but I wanted to push for more. 
in every piece that I've ever made, I tend to build upon and add in little tricks that I learned in the last piece, learning, adding these things that I've been building this entire time back to masterpiece and this crescendo I've been trying to reach of. I've been painting for the last 18 years. Like that's an adult lifetime. And I've been spending my whole life taking these little nuggets and finding out how to take these gems and place them in other areas and taking technique after technique, refining it, finding out ways to apply it to the next piece, seeing how to stretch that on different scales. And I finally felt like I was getting there and I was ready to come to another piece with composition being perfect, tonal balance. And then I've been been kind of drawing this, this line, this universal line between all of my work. So there's blackness there, there's nature, there's the thought process. And even in this the context of the series, Women Are Elemental, I have burning bush preceding this. So again, based on the biblical tale about the burning bush, I have forbidden fruit preceding that one. So this being the water element and women are elemental, burning bush being the fire element, also having the biblical connection and forbidden fruit being the earth element, also having the biblical connection, all of them themed around black women and their elemental essence in our life. So we get to the water element and I'm choosing women in blue dresses. So I should probably be going to my um, <laughs> going to my documentary itself now, like I said, I will watch. So I get to wade in the water. The title itself coming from the burning bush, it just felt like it at the time it was exactly perfect. So I needed the same exact size canvas when I'm making this companion piece to burning bush, basically within this total tripartite series at the time, but would grow to, or triptych series, excuse me, but would grow to be a, whatever the four denomination is for a triptych. <laughs> so I went to Michael's and this was during the pandemic and every single person is out here right now trying to be an artist. So the first Michael store we stopped to, I can't find the size canvas I need. And it's an odd size canvas, it's 15 by 30. And no, like I've never painted on a 15 by 30 painting. I can't, I can't understand why people were buying 15 by 30 canvases. And I'm sure there are a lot of glitter artists out there, you know who you are, who are just picking up the canvases that I need to do what I'm thinking is gonna be a masterpiece and just throwing glitter at the canvas. And this is not actually putting down anyone out there except one specific person who was a great friend and has been pushing me in this the whole time. So this is your shout out. So I get to Michael's, they don't have it. And I go to a completely different Michael's store, like maybe 10 minutes away. And I'm like, I have to have this canvas tonight. I'm so energized from finishing that burning bush painting. I have to start getting this out there. This started off as a drawing on, um, a drawing in a sketchbook. And actually the sketchbook itself, just talking about my village, helping me to build up to this point. The sketchbook that I drew that in, I had never used. I never used that sketchbook for anything. I got it as a gift for Christmas from my boy Austin, um, maybe four years ago. And I actually didn't even think about this until now. It, it's probably more than four years ago, five years ago. And Austin bought me the sketchbook for Christmas. I think I got him like a toy microphone at the time, the old school Mr. Microphone joints, because I was encouraging him to push into his passion with comedy. And he was encouraging me to push into my passion with artwork. So never join the sketchbook. This time something said I need a, fair, a large enough size sketchbook and I use a typically a smaller sketchbook. So I guess that's why I never used it. It was not in the front to you, Austin. Great gift. I just never found the utility in it at the time. And you're not the only person to ever get me a sketchbook. And that's important too. So many people try to push me and I'm just not ready to move until I'm ready to move. And this is hopefully to you all the culmination of Zan being ready to move. I... It wasn't that I wasn't feeling that push from everyone and I felt that momentum, but the content and consistency wasn't there. I wasn't ready to step into that purpose yet. And again, I did a preview of this a couple weeks ago, a couple months ago now, because I, again, I finished this in September and just, I'm just now feeling like it's my gift to you. I will release this on my birthday. So it's my gift to you on my birthday that I'm allowing you to see this and, and you being everyone. So back to the idea of I've been talking about this for a while. Austin helped me to, to get this sketchbook. I'm, I'm putting all of these pieces together into this artwork that I didn't know I needed to make this, this final, and let me take that back, not final, but this, this, this peaking moment. And of course, I'm gonna pass that zenith 
hopefully soon with my next piece, but I'm putting so much into this. So this is what I'm bringing with me to Michael's and then I go to the shelves and the shelves are empty and I can't even find the canvas that I need to work with. So I go about 10 minutes away, we get to the next Michael's store, I'm finally able to find my canvas and I'm walking out like, yeah, this is the one, this is the one. So I had the concept knowing it was paired with burning bush. I knew I wanted it to be waiting the water with the allusion to the Negro spiritual. I knew I wanted it to be black women as our saving grace when I talk about how elemental they are. And then I needed to see which models I would use to represent this. So building off of the burning bush, I actually started with an, a woman with an orange dress and in somewhat of a power pose. So with this one, I wanted blue dresses. And it started off with just one woman, actually. So Instagram surfing, found someone in a blue dress walking through walking through this, this kind of greenery back wall. And we have one of those at our backyard at our house. So even that was just the image that triggered me. And, okay, I need this, this backdrop. This green is something that's resonating with me from synapses firing from something I remembered or I see in past every day. So that was inspiration in that moment. And then eventually it's evolved to, I had never done more than one figure in a piece. So I needed to do two figures and I wanted to push myself even further because I know based on the burning bush piece, I can do a singular woman in front of a tree and a dress and make it look good. I needed to go farther than that. So I'm thinking at the time, okay, another woman in a blue dress, but it needs to be different enough. So I even chose someone where I could get contrast. So the first woman was lighter skin. The second woman, I wanted darker tone skin so I can get that contrast of showing I can paint people of both hues. So I'm not limited to just dark painting people with this bronze tone. I'm not just limited to painting people with this, this glistening umber. I can bring lights and hues and, and bring pinks and greens and and fuchsia and all types of other things off of different types of skin tones. So I wanted to have those people be juxtaposed in, in color, but also have the monochromatic theme of both blue dresses because I wanted them to have this water theme. So if my orange dress is going to be my fire, it's blue dresses as water. And then you think about the canvas sizes themselves, orange and blue being complementary colors, I wanted that to be a companion piece. So I find another woman, dark skinned woman, darker dress, and I'm drawn to her because of the way that her legs are showing through the, the sheer dress. And I had never really done something see-through before. So I was like, that's another way to push myself. I need to get something where you can see the skin tone under it, but the hue itself is still blue. So I had to push myself farther there. So it was the perfect challenge. And then her dress also has these ridges in them, in it. So the reticulation of the ridges even, I'm like, how do I go and really get something like that and pull it out and really make you feel the weight of it and feel like the material was flowy because the material had this movement to it and you'll see my body do this, but the material had this movement to it where there was so much, there was just so much action in the dress and if I wanted them troubling the water and touching that water, and I always heard the, the Trouble the Water song, so I didn't have this biblical context when I first heard it, but when I heard Trouble the Water, I thought that they were shaking things up and disrupting slave ships when I, whenever I heard that, that spiritual. So I wanted these women actually troubling the water in the way that I thought and not necessarily the John 5, 9 or 5, 4, maybe John 5, 4 verse that I, I referenced in my Instagram post. So I've got my two women. And at this time, while I wanted them troubling water, you'll see the, split, the slave ship and we'll get to that, but I didn't even know that that slave ship would be in it when I first got there. So the drawing that I had when I drew it out, the two women are actually just standing in the water together and there is no boat there. So we get from that to, and I'll let my video go a little bit as I sip. Ah, man, that's so crisp. So we go from that to, to the women getting from that drawing in the sketchbook that Austin gave me to the women going on the canvas. And you'll see in the video now that it's just another view of your vision coming to fruition. So I'm sitting here, I have a concept that's not made real yet. It's just in the back of my head. It's been implanted by all these things that have been building up my entire life. It's been influenced by all these other characters in my life. But this is all of this coming out of me. This is all of this experience. This is all of this lived experience investments of energy from other individuals coming out onto a canvas in one day. And 
again, why I didn't want to give you all of this. I want you to appreciate this journey. I want you to appreciate those in my life who I appreciate. I want you to understand everyone that played a role in this. I want you to know that I've had to experience life to be able to even appreciate black women in the way that I do right now. And this is something that I don't want to undersell. This is very important to me. The reason I'm doing my artwork is because this is my life. I'm giving you pieces of me on this canvas. So the same way you hear your favorite musical artists go out there and you're like, man, they had to live really great to build this album. They went through a lot. They went through trauma. That's what I'm giving you when I paint. I'm giving you what I've been through. And I can't just microwave that. When I, I, Those who have, who have purchased things from my site, when you get your receipt, you see that it says, True Luck Charms, this is slow roasted, not microwaved. I've always held that thought process up. I'm not going to rush it. And again, to that, that Nipsey Hussle song, I know perfect timing feels like I'm too late. I know I'm still great in spite of my mistakes. Like how prophetic. And the reason I chose that as my lead into the trailer for this was just, this is perfect timing. So I'll, I'll get a little tangential through this, but I want to give you these real moments because I'm emotional thinking about how important this has been to me. And it's not as if other artwork doesn't get this level of thought and this level of energy, but each time I'm continuing to level up. All right, so we got women on campus. <laughs> um, and then I get right into the skin tone. That's where I excel. We know that's my sweet spot. I am... I, I love skin tone. It's it's the one thing that I just can't get around. It's my favorite thing. I and, and black skin tones, right? They're, they're just so beautiful. They're so radiant. There's so much elegance to black skin. The way the light dances on it, the way it intermingles with the sun, it is incredible. And then you get to the texture of black hair and the way that it coils, the way that it curls, the way that you can see the weight to it, the way that you can see the light through it, it just has something, it harnesses things. And when we talk about a crown, the way it adorns your head and it lets you know that, I mean, to even be able to hold your head up <laughs> with a heavy head of hair as a black woman, that alone is just beauty in itself. Like, I mean, just really think about that and the weight I wanted to have as this woman was looking down with the hair spiraling, I wanted it to be felt that she was still holding herself up. It, it's it's dainty even, um, and not dainty in the negative way, but it's it's just a it's it's just a light lean in. So I have that going on here. Skin tone knocked that out really quickly. It's just again, I, I love it so much. It's probably where I first start on most paintings. So I did the skin tone on the light skin woman, and then I did the skin tone on the dark skin woman, and Again, I already found my speed with the dark skin, so I worked that so quickly because in the last painting with the burning bush, I had that woman who was darker skin, so I knew how to really get that 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 glow to it. I wanted it to look like it had shea butter all over it. I wanted it to look like you could smell what the skin looked like walking through this water. It's a cultural element that you just can't miss in your paintings. And it's one of those things where when photographers don't know how to photograph people of color and specifically black people in our full spectrum, you just miss so much. When you think about the African woman being the mother of civilization, and we know that African, the, the oldest human female skeleton was found in Africa. So when we think about that, and if we really think about it from even a creationist standpoint, and we assume that one woman was the mother of all, then you think about the fact that African skin, or, or excuse me, the, the melanin content in people of African descent can produce all colors in the entire spectrum. We have albinos and then we have people with skin like those from Senegal, who it's almost like this rich, the earthiest rich black I've ever seen. So wanting to get that spectrum here was extremely important to me. And then harnessing that from what I've done before with the burning bush lady, I was like, okay, I can do the skin. I can do skin tone and features in this really tiny way. So I'd be remiss if I didn't point that out, that this was my first time really working this small on a face. So I got kind of close to that small on the, on the burning bush woman, but I could go even smaller. So you'll see here where I have my finger up next to the face just to show this is the size of my thumb I'm getting this level of detail in. I've never worked that small in my life in a painting. Tiny, tiny brushes. 
and I'm getting in there and getting eyelashes pulled out on think like an eyelash that's thinner than my fingernail. <laughs> it, 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 it blows my mind to be quite honest. This, I really stretch myself in ways I've never stretched myself. I use more brushes than I've ever used while working on this. And it was just every day there was a new challenge that I walked in to find and it was fun to just work through it. I had never really, I, I, I shy away from art and we've talked about this from a confidence standpoint before in bits and pieces. So I'm gonna talk about it a little bit more at length here. I genuinely struggled and I'm using that as past tense. I struggled with my ability to be great. I struggled with the thought that anything I produced was a fluke when I finished it. So when I finished this one thing and I thought it was really good, if the response wasn't what, it, what I thought it would be or people didn't appreciate it, then that was, I was like, oh, so it's not that great. It's, it's okay, it was good for me, but it's not good for the world. And good for, the, good for me is cool, but I need good for the world. I need people to appreciate this. I need to know that people are talking about this work. So it would, it, I would get in my head and when I'd sit down to do something, I would say the idea is too grand. I got as far as I got in the last one, but that wasn't as good as this next idea. And if I try to do this next idea, I'm never gonna finish. I'm never gonna, like, there's no way I could pull it off. And there's no point in disappointing myself. There's no point in pulling out a half-ass product and not letting people see what's good. So I would always approach the next piece and just stop. I, I, have, I have canvases drawn out in my, in my closet in my studio for ideas that I had in 2014, ideas from 2008, just abandoned. Back to that confidence factor. I, I, and now I walk in this room after finishing this feeling like a heavyweight champ. I feel like I can do anything. And that's why this piece is so important to me. So when we talk about, I put in all these different items that I'd never even experienced before. I've never painted clouds before in my life. But what I leveraged was my past of painting white things. So I painted a white sock. I think on my Instagram page not too long ago, I found a slide that I had from high school of one of my, probably my first painting I did, if not one of the first five I ever did. And I was about 16 years old. I'm pulling on a sock. I, I don't really know what the meaning of the painting was, to be honest, but I'm pulling on my sock. And the sock itself had these purplish and pinkish hues. And it was my first time saying, this is what I want. A white color to look like and it's because like you look the average person looks at a cloud the cloud is white but it has all these different things from the uv spectrum coming through it it has light from the sun it has the shadow from the trees this cool well it's not shadows from the trees but this coolness to it it has the formation of the earth around it there's so much more to that cloud than just oh it will be a white fluffy cloud so i would spend time outside staring at the clouds i think about how i actually painted this 16 years ago now and then continuing to think about okay how do i really come in and build the right cloud for my piece how do i make it not look like just a white sticky thing without these different hues to it and this movement and the shape and this fluffiness and this weight so again leveraging something i learned 16 years ago still bringing it in now i would go out look at clouds in my backyard just stare at the sky then I got back and just mixed up the blue for it. And I was like, okay, I'm mixing and mixing because again, I mix all of my colors from scratch. So back then my art upbringing years and years ago, I was taught you don't paint straight out the tube. So I'm not, I'm never going to go and buy cerulean blue and just use cerulean blue. I'm going to make my own blue. I'm going to add something to that, whether that's Payne's gray, whether that's titanium white, whether that's, I don't know, a ver viridian, a vermilion, uh, a little bit of dioxanine purple. I'm probably pronouncing that first chemical word wrong. Violet hues, cobalt blues. I'm adding so many different things to make sure that I'm getting to the perfect tone. I'm like, my name is Antoine. I might as well have been named Pantone. I'm doing everything I need to do to make sure that these hues are exactly how I need them to go from my palette. So I waste a lot of paint. <laughs> Cause the other side of what slows me down in my process is I never quite mix the same exact color again because <laughs> it's like mad science. Like, I don't even know. It's alchemy. It's it's metallurgy and, and legitimately because some of these, these paints have light in them. So I'm probably going a little crazy from fumes over 16 years of painting. Cadmium yellow, cobalt blue. Like, there, there are metal, metallic materials in the paints I'm using. 
And when we talk about metallic elements and women being elemental, we can draw that tie as well. But you have this thing where I'm sitting every single time trying to get the right percentage of each thing. And it's just like, I'm a freak for gold, right? So you have to mix copper to make rose gold. White gold has a little more nickel or silver in it. So when you're doing these mixtures, every brand has their different version of it. So Rolex has the Ever Rose, and it's a different hue of rose gold than the Tiffany Rose Gold. And then some people call it pink gold. So you're mixing your hue, but how do you get it right each time? So again, I'm not just painting. Like I said, I'm giving you metallurgy. I'm giving you alchemy. So never mix the same color twice. Start blocking in colors. And... I started focusing on the background before I focused on the dresses because in the past, I've always just been center figured, do the figure, or yeah, figure centered, excuse me, do the figure, do the dress close, and then you get bored. So that's why you see so many of my portraits with these unresolved backgrounds because I just don't want to do anything else. I executed this thing so well, back to that confidence, will I mess up if I try to add a background? Will I detract from how good I did on the, on the, the figure piece? So in this, I felt comfortable because, again, I needed to push myself further. So I start working on the clouds and the sky in the background. And then you really start to see your vision take shape when you start putting pieces around it. So this pushed me in a different way where before I could only see my vision as far as that figure in front of me because I didn't have that background resolved and I didn't have the pieces and I couldn't see things coming together. When I started going in and blocking things around this image, it started becoming very abundantly clear who these women were going to be and the role they were going to play. So I get to thinking about how I'm going to do the waterfall and back to, or, or excuse me, the cavern itself because I want this to be this enclosed space for them troubling the water. And there's another part here that alludes to another painting where I guess I could give it to you this early in the documentary. The cavern itself is actually in the shape of a woman's legs which goes back to the forbidden fruit piece where the woman's legs are open as well. So you have this, this double entendre, borderline innuendo here about the, uh, the purity and this, this waiting in the water itself. But I wanted to have this waterfall and, and back to nature just being kind of nasty. When you look at nature, you see these things if you really look at it through maybe a weirdo artist lens who's been sitting around cadmium for the last 16 years. So I start thinking of how I want to represent this this open open space then i go back and i'm blocking in the trees the tree and i wanted the trees to have this sway and this movement to them i i all, i'm so big on movement and the way that you can feel the breeze through the trees that's my favorite thing when i go on hikes and i go on hikes fairly regularly so during the time that i was creating this i was going in the woods i was going in the water to pray myself, stepping my feet in the water. I wish I had part of that in this video. Stepping my feet in the water to pray and face the sun and talk to God and back to the clouds. I, I felt like when I was speaking with God, the clouds would recede and the sun would, warm, would shine warmly on my face. And then when I was done and I felt like it was well with God and it was well with my soul, the clouds would go back. And when we talk about these prophets who would go out in nature and see things in the wilderness and back to this burning bush, I was having these moments with nature, with God, communing with universe, communing with spirit. I felt like I was just so into, and I still feel in tune with the infinite. So I was feeling like I needed to feel that movement of God through the trees. I needed to feel like these women were truly from God and angels from God troubling this water. So I'm looking at other ways to make the, real, the reality here. Because again, these two women didn't coexist. I, these two women didn't, like, they don't exist together at all. It's a completely made up scene, but I wanted the scene to feel real. When I thought about those scenes from the old masters and we were studying Botticelli in, in, in college, excuse me, in high school, I dropped art for five years from college. And then the year after college, I didn't even touch art, which if you go and watch my corporate mass video, you'll get my explanation of that. So I, I learned in high school about Botticelli and about Caravaggio and Michelangelo and and Leonardo da Vinci and just all these great masters the Sistine Chapel you're learning about about the girl with the pearl earring from Vermeer and you're learning about um I mean you're just I, I don't like the Mona Lisa to be clear so I'm not even gonna go there but you're learning about Venus on the half shell or the birth of Venus excuse me uh, Ninja Turtles reference came out but you're learning all of these things and 
you're seeing how the old masters create the Last Supper and they're creating these scenes that you know did not exist, essentially. You had some of the things where people pose for a portrait, but these elaborate scenes and even down to Picasso's Guernica, like those things did not exist, but it was their interpretation of it. So I'm putting this scene together for you to see. This is my biblical, this is the ascension of Christ for me. So and not saying this is akin to that in the Bible, but when I talk about the painting itself, this is my version of the ascension of Christ. This is my Sistine Chapel. This is my birth of Adam. This is me giving you my interpretation of what was happening in the Bible. And then when you add in the context that we don't see black people in the Bible, there's been this greatest trick in history to remove people of color from this religion and from this, this, from this region. I wanted to make sure that we were present in these stories. So... We get to me blocking in the walls now. I wanted warmth there in the walls. Uh, this orange is really important because I wanted it to be very, very earthy. Because even though this is the water piece, I wanted to show that I could build on the earth that I was doing in the Forbidden Fruit piece. When I get to that video, we'll work backwards in the series. But the Forbidden Fruit piece is actually made after the, the layers of the earth's crust, which a lot of people will probably miss. So really excited to talk about that. So again, I wanted that 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 red clay, that that malleable earth type of tone. And because orange and blue being complementary colors again, I wanted some of that raw sienna to pick up oranges to bounce off of the blues of the women in the water. So I'm working this, this warmth and cool. Again, concepts that are really important that I learned when I was 15 years old, still working today. So I'm blocking that in and again, feeling like I'm finding the cavern and I'm finding the, the composition start to fit again and feeling how these women fit in this space and how they sit next to one another and how they play off of the other elements in the piece. So then I'm like, I've got the walls. I probably gotta start doing water. Never painted water before in my life. It's been one of the things I've been so scared of and why this water piece for the water element was so late. I've never, I'm like, what do you do? You paint? How do you paint clear? <laughs> that was essentially what I've been questioning my entire life. How do you paint clear? Now, Janet Fish, she's my favorite artist for how she paints clear glasses. She paints things with just this, the, the vibrance of her colors coming through there. Again, to the way I did the clouds, it reflects that in see-through things. She's incredible at it. Uh, discovered her when I was a 16-year-old kid. And that's not in this piece, but just want to give her her props. So how do you paint clear? I couldn't do that. That's not my lane. So I'm like, okay, well, water isn't really clear. Let me get out and study it again. It's clear, yes, but what colors show through are from the sky above and the earth below and the things next to it and the reflections. So I'm going out and I'm studying water at the Trinity Fork River here in Dallas. And I'm, or, or the Elm, I think it's the Elm Fork of the Trinity River. So I'm going to the Lake Louisville Environmental Protection Reserve area and taking hikes and, and walking alongside the river bank and looking at the wildlife and saying, okay, this is how I want to feel like I'm able to represent my piece. I want to show the depth of the water. I want to show that the banks themselves are sitting there and building up against it and hitting against it. So I wanted that depth though. And the dark, the dark tone in my water is intentional to show that this is not light water that these women are treading or troubling, excuse me. It's not just a puddle. Like there is depth here and the women as there will get to it but as they touch that water, them being angels, they're illuminating the water. So I wanted their light to hit the water and I needed to study water out in nature at different times of day to see how that water actually reflected light and see what it would look like if there was a light below it, just making it glow. So you get to that part here where you have this glow from her footsteps and bringing it back to that, th there's always this holy element, the halo, the I'm, I'm making Jesus's head glow. I'm making angelic things look light and airy. And oftentimes they made that element be based simply off of the person's skin and the skin being fair. But the way I brought it in is their skin is so rich that it radiates this light. It harnesses the light. And I'm going to keep using harness, but it, it harnesses the light. And every time I try to get out, you pull me right back in. Like it, it just captures it in some way that is just unmistakable and undeniable and endemic to our people. So you're getting this light in the water, then I have to get the ripples. I wanted to show the movement. So 
I'm taking this tiny, tiny brush again, things that I started learning elsewhere, and making sure that I'm getting these ripple elements in and making sure that this water is, is alive, that this water is moving, that there is action in this, that this is a stormy sea. And if Jesus is going to tell you to go out onto the water, you'll go because the master told you to do so. So this is that kind of, of biblical context that I'm bringing into everything I've ever read and all of these parables and trying to make sure that I'm feeling this action around water. There was stillness in the water, but there's always going to be action as well in the Bible. And you're getting these this dichotomous look at it where sometimes the water is still, sometimes it recedes on both sides, but other times there's just movement, there's action, there's clashing, there's gnashing, there's floods, but it's all purity. So in that, I'm just, I'm working this water and why the water is so important down to baptisms, down to ideas of just, it's an archetype throughout time, throughout all different cultures where water has always meant purity. Water has always meant necessity. Water is nourishment and the water element and women being elemental in the way that water is, again, just so important to our very everyday being. There's no way we can be here without them. And I want to give that homage through this artwork again, and specifically black women being elemental. I needed this water to be tight. <laughs> I needed it to be all of those things and all of the things that I could not describe as well in one piece. So I spent a lot of time on this water. It was one of those things where it, and you can't call a piece water without it being amazingly good at looking like water. So I knew I had to get to the waterfall eventually as well, but just even getting that water that they're standing in and acting in was important. So eventually, you see, I start feeling a little comfortable. I'm getting my smile back. Um, I'm mixing paper, mixing paint again to get these sails because I, I came up with this boat idea halfway through. I actually learned about the Clotilda pretty, pretty late. So imagine this, when we talk about our history, why was I, today years old, basically sitting, I mean, six months ago, learning about the last slave ship to dock on U.S. shores, way after it had become illegal to even trade in enslaved bodies, the Clotilda still washed up or didn't, didn't wash up. They brought it to the shores in Alabama and then burned it um, to hide the evidence. But I'm, I'm just learning about that. And I decided to put it in here or a clipper ship in this painting, just thinking about what if they were troubling that water and stopping that ship. When we think about our ancestors, what our ancestors have rather not come here to this country. Imagine you arrive in a country in 1863, I believe it was. Um, and every other person that looks like you here is already Americanized. They're, they were born in America by that time. So that generation, or they have American customs from their family members or whoever they've been brought next to that had been here for generations. And you have this, again, juxtaposition of you're putting these two groups of people who you completely shattered their cultures and all tribal customs next to each other in a completely different time frame. Like it's even, it may have even been worse than the beginning, but those people survived and thrived there and built their own, like Africatown, Mobile, or maybe it's not in Mobile, but Africatown in Alabama. Um, just the fact that they could even take that journey and transition that journey into what stood today, I had to include something about it. So one, our history not being told to us, the fact that I, I'm so compelled by that story, but just learned about it at 32 years old is ridiculous. But it was, they actively tried to erase it from the history books by burning the ship down. Like, <laughs> did something illegal, brought slaves from Africa to America, but tried to get rid of the history in real time because they knew it was wrong. Slavery was so important to this nation that it had been, a, it had been banished. And they still said, nah, I gotta get more slaves in. Got to find out a way to do it. Got to contract for a couple more. Like, how much did you have to use our bodies? Are we that? It's, it's incredible how much people want to deny the impact of, of slavery on this country, on our people. How it has completely shattered us for generation upon generation. If you even think about that gap that I talked about then, and then you think about the lasting impact there, and then 
the lasting impact of the wealth from that family who owned that last ship, ship of slaves. And then you think about their ability to have access to fair housing afterwards. And all of these things that continue to widen that gap between us. And we want to deny that these things exist. And we want to say that paintings like mine are too hard to look at. And we want to say, I don't want to hear about this thing that happened. But it has lasting effects to this day. So again, same concepts I've been discussing for a long time, bringing these things into my artwork. So I'm painting the sails. I'm thinking, you know, I've got to represent the ship. And to be quite honest, I'm calling this done, but I've been considering bringing in uh, fire from the last painting, because that was my first time painting fire, bringing that element into this and having the sails on fire here and giving another little extra pop of orange to bounce against this blue dress in the back and give that extra something just to set the piece off so don't remember if i've ever painted a ship before either so i mean crazy google searches for a clipper ship wanted to have the sails collapsing to show that action when you get to her feet you see the splash in the water and the fact that that sail is kind of breaking in or not a, i don't know if it's a, a masthead or what but this woman I wanted to make sure that I had her in that action and that's why her dress was so important. I wanted her dress to sway and move and to be able to get that just, again, it's all about the action here. It's all about her stepping into the water and it's not quite a stomp, but you know, whatever she did, she made a hit. And the stripes, the undulation, the reticulation, getting all of that. I don't know what, I don't know many terms about women's dresses. I don't even know what material this is. Let's just say sheer, but I needed to get that see-through quality. And then once I got done with that one, I think it was a, a cakewalk for me, to be honest, to walk to the lighter blue dress because that was very similar to the orange dress from the, the other woman. So it was just a, was this a maxi dress or something. It was just soft fabric that laid over the form. And the way that I brought my brush across it and blocked in the blues was just going to be a different move. I'm telling myself to trust in the process because I hated it when I started it. I thought it was going to be easy. I get to it. I'm like, oh, this doesn't really look right. I don't know how these colors are going to match with one another. I don't know if they're going to balance and, and meld together. But obviously, it ended up working out as I started, again, trusting my process, trusting in the vision. Then I started getting those, those even the cool shadows. So I'm using this, this purple with, with a lighter. It's got a little bit of, of white in it. It's got some blue. It's got some Payne's gray. So it comes out to be this this light amethyst kind of color, or at least in, in my mind, that's what it is. And it just gave this, this, it gave, again, weight to it. For the dress to be so sheer, it gave angularity. It gave just the, I don't know, it gives a calm. When you look at her face, you look at how gentle she is looking in the water, you know that she's acting, but the, way, the coolness in the dress presents calmly. And I needed that to be calm in this figure as well, because when you have angelic power, you don't need to wield that over people in any over our, over necessary way, I'll say. So it's just that gentle wielding and back to black women being so powerful in the way that they wield the power they have. That gentleness is just amazing to me. So uh, again, I waste too much paint. Uh, this was just crazy in and of itself when I think about the amount of mixing, like I was saying before, I probably couldn't get back to this if I tried. Look how much paint is on the on the actual foil, and then you get me trying to you get me trying to replicate that in that tiny, 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 tiny portion I had of the paints I did mix. I had to do this all in one sitting, so that's why I typically come in and I'm going and doing one piece of work at a time within a painting. I'm doing many paintings each time but trying to stay true to the colors that I'm blocking. And so I can't mix too much white with something or an area that's orange with the area that's blue. I wanna chunk off that piece and attack that and handle one thing on my plate as a time, at a time. And it's kind of, it's just project management planning as well. It's like, what's my milestone? Okay, I'm coming in tonight and I'm gonna finish this dress. I have something I can achieve, cool. I'm not gonna stop until I get done on that. What are the potential delays to doing this? Is there any risk involved? What are my opportunities of getting ahead of doing this? Okay, could I complete it all today? If I do that, what could I start on next? So I'm coming in with a plan. And we all know no plan survives att first attack or first contact with the enemy. So it might have to adjust. 
but being adaptable was extremely important through the whole process as well. Being adaptable, but being confident enough to know that even through that adjustment, I would still be excellent on the other side. Lessons, just all my life lessons poured into this. So again, I wanted to have this build up between that, that woman standing in front of the burning bush in the first piece, and then the women here, and then you get that very clear balance now. Things are starting to shape up. You're starting to see that cool blue. You're starting to see it, how it could balance against that woman in the orange in the burning bush. So, and I'm going back and filling in the walls again. And the walls themselves are, uh, well, the cave walls, that is, I'm making up these structures. So I'm really just sitting here looking at different pieces to say, okay, how would I go about making this rock form? How do I make it detailed? How many tones do I need? I'm, and I'm watching cartoons often, to be honest. So this actually is probably the most illustrative part of the whole painting and brings this kind of, it's almost comic to me in that it, it this piece is real, but then you, that's the only part of it that makes me feel like you know it's not a real scene is because of the way that I did these rocks. And they have so much realistic detail Yet they also, it, it kind of reminds me of where Mufasa died in The Lion King, to be honest. It's, it's, it, it just has that resonance to it. So I've got that working on. I'm getting these tiny rock formations in there, many mountains on their own in each piece. And in this, I had to learn how to really do, I never liked doing an underpainting, but essentially that's what I ended up doing here. So I'm doing this underpainting and then going back and laying on layers afterwards to add that depth to the rock and to add the shadows and again, give it those slices and cuts to it. Never been to the Grand Canyon in my life, never looked it up, anything like that. But this is exactly what I felt like I'd seen just in, in, in those other areas that I was going when I was hiking, just looking at even the small earth formations under the water and looking at how things slide and slip. I wanted to have that that balance of the depth and then also the, just the, it's, it's just, it's cavernous. I keep saying the same word, but the way it caves in, the way it closes, the way it, it holds. And again, back to this, these also being thighs, just I'm not gonna have a nasty Nelson moment, but the way that you could be comforted <laughs> in the the envelopment of flesh so I, I finished painting com almost nearly everything there were small little tiny details to go in and what I do every night when I finish something is I sit and obsess over it so the moment I am done I will I take 50 million pictures as I'm going through it and much of that you've got on Instagram and as I'm I'm looking I step away 50 times or so step back, look at the painting. I'm thinking, okay, this isn't right. I can see my mistakes when I step away. I go take some time, I go out, I get some fresh air, I look at nature. I need to experience life in between things. I need to go get, gain my confidence sometimes in between and say, okay, I'm ready to go back and do battle again. I'm ready to go and work on this. So I needed some relief. I had been been getting getting too, too uptight with the work because I was at the, the finish line, basically. I had to just get the waterfall done after that. That was pretty much all I had left to go. So that's my lovely wife down there giving me a pedicure because she makes sure that I have everything I need while I'm working on my dreams. She makes sure that anything that could possibly be in the way of me achieving my goals is out of the way. Making sure that I will never have any distraction come in that could possibly take me off the path. So this was just, babe, I see you've been working hard. Let me make sure that you're doing okay. Are you taking care of yourself? Uh, I mean, and this is no no BS. Um, this is no BS pedicure. She gets out the paraffin machine, like she goes to work. And I do sit in an office all day, so I don't really have rough feet. But she still works very hard. So I'm getting this pedicure, but even then, I can't stop looking and obsessing at the painting. So I'm looking at it. I'm looking at other pieces, doing research, and pieces being other photos of mountains and waterfalls. And at this time, I'm like, okay, I'm ready to start getting to the waterfall. I'm ready to to really attack this last thing. And this is back to the, how do you paint clear? Pardon me, how do you paint clear? So the waterfall itself is typically going to be the rush of water. It's basically this whitewash, white water rafting type of thing. You know it's moving, you know it's thick, 
you know that it has this gush to it. How do you show that and then also show the moment in time as a snapshot of that gush pausing, the, that leave moment? So I figured out the way that I wanted to approach it. I needed to look at waves. I needed to look again at some undulation. I needed to look at some cascading types of things. And at first I start getting it and it just looks like a drip. So essentially what I need to do is carve out forms within this formless flowing body of water. And I'm building it up, but I'm also trying to make sure it doesn't look like it's the same color as the dress. So I'm adding layers on layers on layers just to make sure that I am creating this depth in the water and making sure that it actually has this action and this active fall to it. And then it gets tricky because I'm trying to make sure that it shows up misty behind it, but also have that that action again where that foot comes into the water and you can see it clearly through it. So I had to study pictures of this woman in water and see how flesh shows from under the clarity of water, which again, just that and all these other elements in the piece I'm trying to pull together into these really tiny paintings within the painting. So you have these these items where I'm going in and I'm showing this this foot in action and I'm finally feeling like I'm getting the water down and I've got the water crashing against the walls of the cave or of, of this, I still don't know what this is called, but of this waterfall area crashing against the rock formation. Then you see this little piece under there where you see the, the rock peeking under the water and then you see whatever could be below that in the water itself. Then you get, you get the, the reflection of the rocks behind it onto the water and then you get weighed in the water. So you have all of these things that I've been learning for an exceptionally long amount of time placed into one piece where I feel like it is the most technically sound thing that I could have possibly produced. And then you're adding in the content and you're adding in this journey because again, it's important to tell you about this. So I started on May 9th. That was my first introduction I gave you to it. And that was my first the next day, or excuse me, the next post. So when we talk about content and consistency, May 9th was that post. The very next post on my True Luck Charms page was my first fireside chat video. And I don't know what I was doing in those days between the 9th and the 24th, which is what, 15 days doing math. Um, but in that time span, something ignited in me. So something from the time I started this piece said, I need to go and commit myself to art. And when I talked about just God speaking to me, I feel like God has been speaking to me through this piece this entire time that I was working on it. And the very next post on this page, which I hadn't actively used before then as a fireside chat, I'm coming to you now in video form because I started doing fireside chats and getting comfortable and getting some moderate response that this is what you all wanted from me. You wanted to hear me talk about my artwork you wanted to see my process. You wanted to feel these intimate moments. You wanted to sit in the studio with me. You wanted to sit in my mind and take a look around. And this is what I've been giving you. I've been taking you along the journey in the painting via Instagram. I've been taking you along my art journey via Instagram. And now I'm giving this to you in this documentary form, piecing all of these things together and kind of narrating the steps of what it looks like to have a thought, the steps of what it looks like to dedicate yourself to your vision coming to fruition, the steps to overcome confidence and battle yourself at every step of the way, the steps to submitting to God and understanding his will for what you want to do in your life. This has been an incredible journey. And the last time I introduced this on the timeline to tell you all that you had something coming that you needed to see was September 14th. And that's when I released the trailer. I said, last night at 2 a.m. I finished my painting, Wade in the Water. It's probably the most beautiful thing I've ever painted. One day I'll share it with you all. Once I feel like you're able to understand the effort it took me to get here. When I feel it'll be appreciated and valued. I've given a lot to you all, to this canvas, to my entire body of work. This is slow roasted, not microwaved. I have a lot to say. I'll save it for the reveal. And this is the reveal. So, uh, this is my painting. 
weighed in the water. I don't know if you can see this well, but I've been blessed making this and I hope you're blessed by it. I'm the documentarian, presently known as Zan True Luck, and this has been Masterpiece Sitting Room. Happy birthday to me.